The Higher Life, the era of the word revolution, with Apostle Dr. David Kunobua and Pastor Rita Bella. God Almighty, the strong and blessed one, great Jehovah, I am, I am. The book of Exodus, chapter 14, verse number 12 through 16. When you have it, say amen. The Bible says, Is not this the word that we dare tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than, than that we should die in the wilderness. Verse number 13, And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. Uh, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. And verse number 14, the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore, or why do you cry thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward, but lift up thou Lift, up, uh, lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thy hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Somebody say amen. amen. We shall also go to the gospel according to St. Mark chapter number 5. Chapter number 5 of the gospel according to St. Mark. We will read verse number 35 through verse number 41. We will go through that quickly. If you will, in Jesus' name. The Bible says, While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, certain which say, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master anymore? Or any further. Verse number 36. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid. Only believe. Somebody say, Only believe. Verse number 37, and he suffered no man to follow himself Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he cometh unto the ruler of the synagogue, to the house of the ruler of the synagogue. And he seeth the, the tumult um, and them that wept and wailed greatly. Verse number 39, listen everybody. He says, um, when he came, when he was coming, he saith unto them, why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. Let me say it again. The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. God Almighty. They laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entereth in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha Komai, which is by interpretation damsel, I say unto thee, arise and straightway the damsel arose and walked. For she was of the age of twelve and they were astonished with a great astonishment. Somebody shout amen. amen. I can't hear you. Somebody shout amen. amen. This afternoon I'm discussing from the subject. Faith in adversity. Faith in adversity. Come on somebody say it again. Amen. Say it again like you're a born again child of God. Let us pray. Father, Son, and Spirit, we give you praise, glory, and honor. We celebrate your name, your majesty, your omnipotence, your omniscience. You are God almighty beside whom there is no other. We come in this place under one God, one faith, one Father, and one baptism. Oh God, with one exclusive reason to magnify your name and to sit down on the master's feet and hearken unto these precious words of life. Take of the Logos word of God and break down a rema word which shall uh, be uh, downloaded deep down in our spirit man and we shall be recipients of the revelation of your word. Take of the uh, a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God opening the eyes of our understanding and the ears of our receptivity that in hearing we shall hear, in seeing we shall see and we shall behold the riches of the revelation of your word as your servant I decrees 
that you may increase and that you may have full preeminence in this place. Be our tutor, our counselor, our rabbi, even our master to teach us and to guide us into all truth. We magnify your name, ascribing all praise, all glory, and all honor unto your matchless name. In Jesus' name, somebody shout hallelujah. You may take your seats in the presence of the most high God. You and I have been in the series of faith, the works of faith, the dealings of faith, the activities of faith. And we saw in scripture how men of God and women of God had at several times to exercise their faith before the name of the living God. And we saw Hebrews 11 verse number 6. The Bible says that uh, uh, he that cometh unto God must believe that he is and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him if you will. Hebrews 11 5. But without faith it is impossible to please. It, without faith it is impossible so without faith, and faith we say it is not a mental perception that you say, I believe faith is exercised in your works. James writes an epistle to the, to the um, a people he was writing unto, the pilgrims, and says unto them that uh, uh, tell you tell me you have faith. No, let me show you that I have faith by my works. You speak about your faith and you ain't got no works, but I shall show you my faith by my works, which is to mean that our faith is proven by the works that we display. And I also give an example that somebody may say, I love you. Even the Bible says that, that uh, how can you say you love somebody and they go around suffering and they got no food and they got no shelter, they got no clothing and then you say, I love you. Love is not spoken uh, in words. Love is demonstrated. Hallelujah. And the Bible says Romans 5 verse number 8 that God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still seen as yet Christ died for us. He demonstrates, he shows, he exhibits, he displays his love toward us. That while we were still yet sinners, while we were still walking in iniquity, robbing God and uh, abusing God and uh, drinking alcohol, small, smoking cigarettes and marijuana and every kind of junk, God died for us. Jesus never came for the righteous, but he came to cause sinners unto a repentance. He died for you while you were in your sins. If you are righteous, there would be no reason for the Son of God to come off of his throne, strip himself of all of his glory, and be humbled in a fashion as a man, and being found in fashion as a man, he became obedient unto the cross, even the death of the cross. It would not be of any reason for him to do that, but he saw that you and I were heading for hell, and that cross was, was, was toward for you and I. It was you who were supposed to be on that cross. It was you who were supposed to be nailed, stripped naked. They put a crown of thorns in your head. They whoop you on your back until your back has been scourged and you got stretch for wounds on your body. And uh, they strip you naked before everybody and then they mock you. He said, no, Lord, I shall go in their place. This is why the songwriter said, mercy, said no. When judgment was saying, yes, take them to the cross and uh, uh, let them be crucified and let them die in sin, mercy, said no. Hallelujah. Hebrews 11, 15 and 16, the Bible says, uh, Wherefore, that, uh, that we do not have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Hallelujah. We have a high priest called Jesus who was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Wherefore, let us come boldly before uh, the throne of grace that we may do what? Obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time such as this. Obtain mercy from the presence of God Almighty. Obtain the mercies of God. Mercies literally mean that, uh, that, uh, that uh, this is uh, when somebody does not deserve anything and uh, uh, you just have compassion on them and, and pity them because they know not that which they do. Which reminds me Jesus is on the, is on the old rugged cross. He's about to die. And uh, think about people have abused you. They stripped you naked, taken away everything you had. And he said, Father, forgive them for they know not that which 
they do. It reminds me also of the patriarch Stephen in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter number 6 and 7, when he was about to die. The Bible says uh, they were not able to stand the spirit and the wisdom by which he spake and he reasoned together with them and they could not stand the spirit and the wisdom by which he spake. And because they could not resist the spirit by which he spoke, hallelujah, they began to find stones and to stone him to death. But why Stephen is dying? He says, he looks in heaven and beholds, the heavens are open and the Son of God is sitting on the right hand of God the Father. Hallelujah. And Stephen said, Lord, don't you charge them with this sin. This is not Jesus. This is a person in a human body, just like you and I. Let me ask a question. Why is it so hard for you, ladies and gentlemen, to forgive and to let go of the people who have wronged you? Somebody who broke your heart. Somebody who betrayed you. Somebody who disappointed you. Hallelujah. Why is it so difficult to let them go? Slap somebody. Tell them, let them go. Let them go. Father, forgive them. They know not that which they do. Every time we hold grudges and we hold unforgiveness in our hearts, we bind ourselves and we hinder our own destinies. Hallelujah. We hinder our own breakthroughs and here you are. You're carrying a Tom and you're carrying Jackson and you're carrying a Jackie and you're carrying a Henry and you're carrying John in your heart because they disappointed you and they broke your heart and they never lived up to your expectations. Let them go. They're living run free in your home. Hallelujah. They're living grant free in your house. Let them go. This is why the Bible says Hebrews chapter 12 verse number 1 that since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight God, every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us all and snare us. Everybody has a weight. And forgiveness is a weight. Anger is a weight. Sin is a weight. Things that we do are weights and we can go to God with all these weights we're carrying in our hearts, on our shoulders. We're hindering ourselves from moving forward because we got a lot of baggage on our shoulders. Somebody said, lay off the excess baggage. There was a time the Lord spoke to me on a Sunday morning and told me, go preach about excess baggage. And I came and I spoke to the church about the baggages we've been carrying and you can go forward. If you got a lot of baggages, God wants to move you forward. He wants to take you to another level. But you're weighing yourself down. Anybody ever gone to an airplane, they will measure how much weight you're carrying. They will never allow you to board on that airplane if you got excess weight or excess baggage. And if you got excess baggage, even the airplane can only carry a certain capacity. So they'll make you pay for that. You're paying for the excess baggage. Oh God. You're paying for all the weights you're still holding. You're paying for all the people you never forgive. You, you never forget. You're paying for all of that. Tell somebody, let them go. Hallelujah. And sometimes as men of God, we go through a lot. You trust somebody. You anoint him as a, maybe the associate pastor or the, the second in church. Hallelujah. And then we train people in ministry. They were a nobody. We pick them from the dust of the ground. But the time comes and uh, they feel they got it all together. And now they think they can even pastor you. And they think they are more anointed than you. And then they walk away from you. And they break your, or they break your heart. But as men of God, we've got to learn also how to forgive and let them go. If you never let them go, you'll never be able to go to another level or the next level God has for you in your life. Because the next level does not require this baggage, excess baggage, weighing you down. You're going into destiny and you're still unforgiving. You're going into destiny. You're about to deal with a lot of people. And sometimes you wonder, you pray for increase and you don't see because you're not ready to handle increase. If everybody came and they broke your heart, if everybody came and they're sorcerers and they want to be with you, if everybody came and they're abusing you, would you be angry at everybody? It's impossible. We've got to learn how to forgive and how to let go. Tell somebody, let it go. Come and slap three people next to you. Tell them, neighbor, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. There is a whole lot of things we've got to learn how to let go. 
people that broke my heart in ministry, I let them go. And I even began praying for them. Jesus says, I curse you not, but pray for them who curse you and those who despitefully use you. In so doing, you shall heap up coals of fire on their head and the Lord shall bless you. You don't do good for them who do good unto you as well. You find somebody who has done you evil, somebody who has poked you in the eye, somebody who is backbiting you, get a thousand dollars, sow it into their lives. And you rebuke that devil now and forever. There's some battles you never have to fight fire with fire. Oh yeah. There's some battles all you have to do is <laughs> sow a seed in their lives. Get a real generous seed. Sow it into their lives. And you will overcome that battle. There are some battles I've learned to overcome by simply loving my enemies. It's not easy to love somebody who hates on you. Somebody who despises you. Somebody who despitefully uses you. It's not easy loving them. They slap you on one cheek. God says turn the other side as well. And let them slap you again. But now after them slapping you then pray for them. And sow a seed into their lives. Somebody shout hallelujah. There is a, somebody who was giving a testimony about one of the men of, Uga, or men of God in Uganda. And uh, she was saying this man's gospel is not easy. And uh, the pastor was preaching because this, uh, this um, uh, woman had a, had a husband who had another woman. Hallelujah. And the pastor was preaching. She has another wife. Go cook food for her. Make her a cup of tea. Speak nicely to her. <laughs> hallelujah and it's not easy doing that it's really it's not easy doing that but that's the scripture of jesus what it teaches unto us they do your evil don't you pay evil for evil pay good for the evil they do unto you and i've seen people that say you know what because you never supported me in my wedding meetings i'm not going to come to your wedding meetings let me find people who never supported me and let me go be there for them through thick and thin and support them all the way Hallelujah. you don't you don't do tit for tat the bible says if you keep on doing tit for tat an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth in that way you have no blessings. Even the heathen do so. The heathen, what they do is they find somebody who's done them all good and they will pay. They're good for the good. But for God to bless you, God has to bless you. Hallelujah. When you find people who have wronged you, people who really deserve to go to the cross and die. Hallelujah. But to pray for them, you find them in a ditch and you pick them up. Somebody who bewitches you and you tell them, honey, you know what? I love you. I'm going to pray for you. That God may deliver you from sorcery because remember we fight not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against rulers of darkness against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places hallelujah wherefore put on the whole armor of god the armor of faith the armor hallelujah of the word of god the armor having shared your gospel with the preparation of the gospel of peace the armor of prayer are you clothed in the armor Somebody shout amen. Somebody shout amen. In the same armor, Paul uh, writes unto the Ephesians and talks about the shield of faith. The shield of faith by which we quench every fiery dart of the enemy. The enemy knows how to fire bullets and missiles and arrows and spears and javelins. Fiery darts of the enemy. The arrow that flies by, the, by day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And they fly by day or by noontime or by the midnight hour. But once you get a shield of faith, you shall be able to quench every fiery dart of the enemy. Somebody shout hallelujah. 
I look at Moses, a patriarch, a servant of God, called by God, given a charge and a commandment to go face Pharaoh, a ruling power and a ruling principality. Egypt was a superpower on the face of the earth at that time. And God says unto Moses, go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. The thing about God, God will never give you a mission and an assignment that you are able to do. I've said it before and I will say it again. God would never say you on a mission, on a work, on an assignment that you are able to do. God will send you on a mission, on a work, on a task, on an assignment that you are not able to do, that you would need the absolute dependence on God to be able to do it. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. We can do this in our own power. We can preach in our own eloquence of speech. We can preach in our own biblical knowledge. We need the Holy Ghost the revelator of the word of God to be able to teach us into all truth. I can't be a preacher without the Holy Ghost. I'm nobody. There is no David could know but without the living God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. God says to Moses, go tell Pharaoh because I need my people out of the land of Egypt. They've been bound for 400 long years and guess what? There is an extra 30 years and some of you, you're way overdue for your miracle. You're way overdue for your breakthrough. You've been in bondage enough time, let alone that, but also overtime in bondage. Overtime in witchcraft, overtime in poverty, overtime in sorcery, overtime in rejection, overtime in reproach, overtime in celibacy. Hallelujah. That's why when God begins to restore you, He restores unto you all the years. Joel 2 25. All the years that the locusts and the canker worm and the palmer worm have been eating away for such a very long time. The God we serve is a God of restoration. When God restored Israel in the self same day, Israel went to borrow articles of gold and of silver from their neighbors, the Egyptians, and the Lord gave them favor before the Egyptians. Hallelujah. And the Israelites, the enemies of the Egyptians came unto them and said, give me your gold. And it's amazing how they automatically went back into their houses and brought out every gold vessel, all the articles of silver, gold and brass and all of that. Hallelujah. And they gave them unto their neighbors, the Israelites. The Bible says in this way, you shall plunder and you shall spoil the Egyptians. Hallelujah. Sometimes you never have to spoil the enemy by fighting fire with fire. When God gives you favor, favor is a weapon. My God. Favor is a weapon as well. I wish I had time that I could talk about favor. Somebody shout amen. Come on, somebody shout Hallelujah. I don't know if you're ready for, for a preacher today. I don't know if you're ready for a preacher today. If you are somebody, shout, I am ready. I am ready. God has said to Moses, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Pharaoh has hearkened to the voice of the living God. But after a very long time, after God had to also rise up as God himself and smote the Egyptians with boils and sicknesses and diseases and turned their waters into red and uh, their dust into something imaginable. Killed every living thing in the land of Egypt. All the birds of the air were killed. All the, uh, the fish in the sea were killed. Hallelujah. And then God also was able to confound the power of the magicians and they were not able to stand before Moses, the servant of God Almighty. And God now has to rise up with one last blow and kill Kill the firstborn of every Egyptian. Kill the firstborn of every Egyptian to fulfill the scripture that thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Egyptians were involved in sorcery and high level witchcraft and God had to execute that word and bring it to pass for him to deliver Israel. And sometimes God will have to do that to bring you out because the power holding you needs to die for God to deliver you. Somebody say amen. They've come out of the land of Egypt. Looks like it's been a bed of roses, them just coming out. But they have no idea what Moses has gone through. Moses has had to face somebody he never wanted to face. And sometimes God will send you on a mission in places you don't want to go. Face people you don't want to face. But God is with you. I say, but God is with you. 
But God, you know, it doesn't matter who may not be with me as long as God is with me. It does not matter who may be against me as long as God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Moses delivers an entire nation. Is it Hosea 12, 13? By a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of captivity, and by a prophet was Israel preserved. So God uses, thank you very much, God uses a prophetic anointing to deliver Israel. This is why Ephesians 2, 20, the Bible says, we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, uh, hallelujah, and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone or the head of the corner. The church is built upon the apostolic and prophetic foundation. Take away the foundation of Moses, Moses and the Lord. There is no New Testament. You take away the foundation of the disciples, the apostolic ministry. There is no anointing of many other people to be made, to be made, to be baptized in the name of Jesus as disciples over all the nations of the world. Wherefore, we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Now Moses has done great signs and wonders by the rod of God Almighty. He's come to the brink of the Red Sea. Somebody say the Red Sea. Lord, if I can preach about anything today, I will preach about the Red Sea. They come out to the brink of the Red Sea. Israel has been delivered out of the land of Egypt. They've come out with substance. They have their animals. They have cattle. They have sheep. They have goats. Hallelujah. They got a whole lot of animals and a whole lot of substances. And now they've come to the brink of a wall. And this wall was not a visible wall called like a wall of Jericho. It was a little war, the waters of the Red Sea. The Red Sea, hallelujah, has its waters coming from uh, Lake Victoria, going through the Nile, and the Nile powers down into the Red Sea. And the Red Sea as well has fountains of the great deep, which are broken up, you know, every night and every day. And they keep on releasing water. And now they're standing at the brink of the Red Sea. They can't see a way forward. They can't see a way going ahead. They can't see any movement forward. And now the Bible says the people began to mourn and to Moses why did you bring us out? Did we not say unto you, uh, we are better off in the land of Egypt, eating lentils and onions? Uh, why did you bring us out to die here at the Red Sea, to die here? Now look, the Egyptians are behind the whole nation of Israel. Ahead of them is the Red Sea. And I know I'm talking to somebody. You can go back, but also ahead of you, there is an obstacle. There is a war. There is a situation. There is a circumstance. There is something you need to overcome. Your right sin may be a financial situation. Your right sin may be an infirmity, a chronic illness. Your right sin may be lack of a job. Yeah, you got a lot of bills to pay. Your right sin may be a, the sickness of a loved one. Your right sin may be stagnancy in a church. Your right sin may be ministers who don't want to serve with you and all they want is positions of power. Your right sin could be anything. Somebody said the Red Sea. Somebody said the Red Sea. There's never a gentleman or a woman whom God is taking into destiny without ever encountering the power and the wrath and the fury of the Red Sea. Everywhere God is taking you, you shall find obstacles. You shall find resistances. You shall find hindrances. You shall find literally a lot of things fighting you and opposing you. God says unto Moses, Moses, listen, Moses begins to cry unto God because the people are crying to Moses and they are whining and they are complaining and they are saying a whole lot of things and it's amazing how they forgot the works of God, how God delivered them from the poverty they were bound in, in the land of Egypt. They forgot about the great works of God, how he was able to confound all the magicians and the sorcerers and the warlocks of the land of Egypt. Hallelujah. It's quick. It's amazing how quickly we forget the works of God when we come to an apparent situation that we cannot cross over. 
Let me speak to somebody who has been whining about where you are. You forget where God brought you out of. You forget how broken, busted, and disgusted you are in Africa. You forget how you are miserable and you whine about the job you don't have right now. You whine about the little you don't have right now. And you forget the good old works of God as in the good old days. Remember the Lord your God. You shall remember the Lord your God who gives you the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant with you. Hallelujah. Don't you get so far and you forget where you come from. The reason they whine is because they've forgotten where they came out of. The reason they cry and they murmur unto Moses is because they quickly forgot how God delivered them from the land of Egypt. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, preach with me. Speak to somebody. Tell them, neighbor, what have you forgotten that I need to remind you of? We need to remind people of the works of God. This is why it is important to testify of the goodness of God Almighty. Revelation 12, verse number 11. The Bible says, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb of God and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto their death. Don't quickly forget the word of the testimony. In other words, don't you hold the testimony right on the inside of you? God did your miracle. Why are you sitting on it? Testify in the congregation of the believers. Let everybody know the power of your God. How powerful he is. How great he is. He's a divider of the Red Sea. He's a killer of the assassins who are looking for you. He's a destroyer of the Egyptians who have been pursuing you. He's a cast breaker. He's a bondage buster. He's a yoke breaker. He's El Shaddai. He's Jehovah Rapha. The Lord our healer. He's Jehovah Nisi, our banner of victory. He's Jehovah Sikano, the Lord our righteousness. He's Jehovah Shando Rabakataya, the God who can do everything. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Lord have mercy. If we begin to testify of the goodness of God, we may spend a whole day just talking about how good and how faithful God has been to us. Let me remind you, remember how you are rejected, how you are broke, how you are busted, how you are disgusted, how you had nobody, how you had no money, how you had no job, how you used to line up in the U.S. Embassy in Africa looking for a visa to come to the U.S. Remember where God brought you out over. Remember how you are a nobody. Remember how everybody left you for dead. Walked out of your life and uh, literally left you uh, for dead. Hallelujah. And God was a friend who stuck with you closer than a brother. Through the night seasons he was with you. In the dead times he was with you. In every season he was God and he proved himself as God and beside him there was no other. The Bible calls him my comforter, my healer, my redeemer, my everlasting father, my Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody shout amen. Amen. Somebody shout amen. Amen. This is why, remember Hebrews 11.6, without faith it is impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe that he is that he is your deliverer, he is your healer, he is your empowerer, he is your restorer, he is a one maker, the promise keeper, he's a covenant keeping God, he is God almighty, remember who he is. Hallelujah. Uh, 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 a few years ago, there was a small clip going around social media and YouTube of a young preacher in Kenya, a small young boy. I don't know if he was eight years of age or what, but uh, he was rebuking Christians and uh, he was like, you know, a lot of y'all come to church and you begin to pray, God, I come before you, Lord. And then he says, you know, you're coming to God. You're saying you're coming to God, but where are you coming from? You know, hallelujah. And people, you know, innocent Christians began praising the young boy. Oh, he's right. But he was not right. It was a wrong misinterpretation of scripture. Because the Bible says, he that cometh to God, he that comes to God. Hebrews 11, 6, must believe. And then also Hebrews uh, 4, 4, verse number 16. Wherefore, let us come boldly before 
God is not on your level. That's why you come from the outer court into the inner court. God is in the holy of holies. You can't come out of the decadence and sinful life you've been living and you think you, God will be there waiting for you every time you call upon him. Hallelujah. Can somebody say amen? Can somebody say amen? We have a situation. They're standing at the brink of the Red Sea. What is your Red Sea? What is your Red Sea? What is your Red Sea? Everybody has a Red Sea. Everybody has a Red Sea. What is your Red Sea? They've come to the Red Sea, ladies and gentlemen. And it's at the Red Sea that their faith has been challenged or challenged. It is at the Red Sea. Now everything, you know, it's one thing to say we believe in God. But I don't, I don't believe somebody believes in God until you face adversity. Until you're going through a hell. Until all hell has broken loose in your life. There's a scripture in the book of Proverbs, chapter 24, verse number 10. The Bible says, if you faint in the day of adversity, then your strength is your strength is small. If you faint or if you lose heart in the day of adversity, your strength is small. The day of adversity is the day when you should prove your faith that you are born again child of God who believes in the name of the living God. You should never come to the brink of the burning fiery furnace and you're like, you know what? All right, now we surrender. We give up to that. Hallelujah. It is that day at the barren, barren fiery furnace where you're like, okay, our God whom we serve continually shall be able to deliver us out of your hand. But if not, let it be known unto you, a king. We shall not serve you or bow down to the golden image or even unto your gods which you have made. The God we serve is a God of fire. He shows up in the fire. If you're going through the fire, that's where God is about to show up. If you're going through fire in your home, fire on your job, fire in your academics, fire in your relationships. That's where God shows up. Somebody shout the fire. fire. My God, may God put some of you in the burning fiery furnace. I pray for you that you shall be put in the burning fiery furnace. That we may see your God. That we may see the God you've been preaching about and talking about. See, I don't need faith when all is well with me. I don't need faith when everything is flowing smoothly and, and everybody is celebrating me, loving on me, and I got the money I need, I got everything I need. I don't need faith. There are things I don't need faith for. Can I mess up your theology? I said, can I mess up your theology? I don't need faith to believe for a car. I just go and buy it. Hallelujah. There was a time I needed faith to go buy a car. But when you grow in God, and God blesses you, you come to a level that you don't need faith. Hallelujah. I don't need faith to dress and look good. I just go buy nice clothes and I dress and I look good. Hallelujah. Oh yeah. Let me mess up your theology, amen. Because you've been told you're going to believe God for everything. Why should you believe God for the things he gave unto you? Listen to Exodus 13, Exodus 14, verse number 14. Listen, everybody, see what happens. Let's go to verse number 15, everybody. Exodus 14, verse number 15. What did God say unto Moses? God said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou? He's saying, another version will say, God said to Moses, Why do you cry? Which is by interpretation, what you're looking for, you already have it. Now, why are you still whining in my face? Why do you still cry? Because God gave Moses a rod, Eldake, and God said to Moses, with this rod, you shall deliver Israel. Moses has a rod in his hand, but he's still crying to God. You got money, but you're still crying to God. On Friday, I said, man, you don't need faith to walk down the aisle. Just go get a beautiful woman and marry her. Yeah. 
Hallelujah. Fasting 40 days. God, show me. God, God. Really? You have a rod in your hand. Wherefore criest thou unto me? Why do you still cry unto me? Yet you have the solution in your hands. You got the power in your hands. You got, you got a degree, but you're sitting in your home. In your home, God, give me a job. The job is not going to move out of Amazon or out of Microsoft and come and find you in your home. You got to go apply for the job. Why do you cry unto me? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There are things God expects you to know how to do that you don't need to pray for or pray about anymore. God shouldn't be bothered with situations that you can handle. You're bothering God. He's running the whole universe. And you're bothering him for candy. You're bothering him for a job. Go apply for a job. You shall get it. Hallelujah. But there are situations I need God for. Situations which are beyond my control. Situations that I know I don't even have the anointing for. But Moses had the anointing to part the Red Sea. He had the anointing. He had the rod. He had no idea that everything he was looking for was already in the palm of his hand. God already gave him the keys to deliver Israel. And when God says, God deliver my people, why do you still have to go whine about increasing the church or whine about some things? You simply go preach the gospel and the lost shall come from everywhere and they shall come and find you. Simply show the power of God and multitudes shall flock to find where the power of God is. Somebody shout hallelujah. What do you think people are flocking to false prophets? Because false prophets have signs and wonders, have miracles. But pastors, true men of God don't even have. And somebody has been stuck in a situation 15 years. And stuck in your church 15 years. A false prophet shows up in one day, it is solved. Trust me, that person will leave your church. Even if it were me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So people are dealing with serious situations. This is why God, Luke 24, 49, he said unto the disciples, Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem. Remind in the city of Jerusalem until you're endured with power from on high. When you go out, I want you to go out when you got power to raise the dead. Power to cast out devils. Power to deliver the bound. Power! Somebody shout Power! We are in a generation of power. Matarado safalakataya. Hallelujah. Let me break it down for you. He came to a point, and the people were so sick in Jerusalem. They were in multitudes, and Peter is already anointed. Peter does not have to go to pray unto God. Lord, will you heal this person? Peter simply said, bring all the sick out. Let them down there and down there. When I'm going for morning glory in the house of God, and the sun is rising up, I shall walk. Somebody said hallelujah. This is a generation of power. We need the true power of God Almighty. Somebody show power. Somebody show power. Remember Matthew 17 and Mark chapter number 9 where we have a situation. Nine disciples are dealing with a demoniac and they can't cast out one demon. Jesus has been transfigured on the mountain. He leaves them at the foot of the mountain. And there are nine disciples. He's been with them for three long years. And nine disciples are saying, we cast you out. We somersault you. We rebuke you. We fire you. And the devil is looking at them. Just laughing and mocking them. Hallelujah. The situation that shall mark you. Some situations, hallelujah, don't respond to your words. Don't respond even to your title. They respond to the power of God on the inside of you. Jesus came and in a moment of time, the Bible says, when the demoniac saw Jesus, immediately the boy fell into the water and he began to convulse because the demon recognized power. There are situations that shall recognize power. Moses is at the Red Sea and he does not know he got the rod of God this is no longer the rod of Moses now this is a rod of God this is a rod of God this is a let me say it again this is a rod Exodus 4 verse number 20 and Moses came down from the mountain with the rod of God 
I thought he went to the mountain with the rod, the rod of Moses. What happened that the rod was transformed from the rod of Moses to the rod of God? Pastor Paul, what happened along the way that the rod ceased to be the rod of Moses and it became the rod? Everybody, you got a rod, and that rod is not your rod. It is the rod of God. Amma, your voice is a rod of God. Josephine, your voice is a rod of God. Pastor Bella, the prophetic anointing you have is a rod of God. Apostle David, the anointing you have is a rod. Tell somebody, neighbor, you got a rod. Why are you still whining? Why are you still whining? You got a rod. Your rod shall make a way for you. Your rod shall, shall break to pieces. Hallelujah. The powers of the Gentiles. Your rod shall part the Red Sea. Your rod shall take you through to where you need to go. And you're still whining and crying to God. God said, stop whining. Why do you cry to me? Why do you cry to me? Hallelujah. And it's amazing how Christians and born again children of God still prefer things they already have. You prefer things you already have. You know why? Because you don't understand the ethics of faith. I'm talking about faith in adversity. The first and adversity. They are at the brink of the Red Sea. They can go nowhere. This is where your faith is required. Moses does not even need faith. Israel does need faith. But Moses does not need faith. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Somebody shout amen. When Sister Shakira is done with her boards, nursing boards, she does not need to cry for a job. She simply goes. And applies. And they give her the job. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. And some of you, you've been having papers for how many years and you're still whining. You've been having papers to work in the U.S. and you're still whining. Yet there are people who don't have the privilege that you have, but they're made it better than you in life. What are you going to cry to God for? Hallelujah. Let me rebuke some devils out of here. Hallelujah. You've been in the U.S. 20 some years and you're still broke and busted and disgusted. More broke than the people you left back in your country. They admire to be where you are and you're saying, Lord, let me go back to Africa. You're going back to Egypt. You're going back to Egypt. You're going, every time situations become hard, why did I come to the U.S.? Every time situations get difficult, Lord, why? You're still whining. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. In the midst of adversity, this is why your faith is required. How many of us remember the Shunammite woman, 2 Kings, chapter number 4? This woman, the Bible says she was a notable woman. Hallelujah. I love notable women in scripture. Notable women, she exercised her faith. She says unto her husband, I perceive that this is a holy man of God. Why should we build a house chamber or an upper chamber for him? A house that he may dwell in. After building the chamber for Elisha, Elisha says unto the woman, uh, uh, what does this woman Woman want. Elisha says then to Gehazi, what does this woman want? Gehazi says, no, she dwells among her own people. There's nothing I need. And Elisha said unto her, no, you say there's nothing you need. But according to your situation, looks like it is a situation of perfection. Yet I see many things are so wrong with you. And Elisha says, by this time next year, you shall embrace a child. And she said unto the man of God, don't you lie unto me, thou man of God. It came to pass, she conceived, gave birth unto the child. One day the boy gets a headache, goes to the daddy, and the daddy sends the boy to the mother. The mother, the boy lays on the mother's lap, and at noon time, the boy died. Hallelujah. At noon time, the boy died. At noon time, the miracle has died. At noon time, the marriage has gone asunder. At noon time, the situation has gone unglued, the opposite direction. At noon time, the church has broken up and you don't know where to go anymore. At noon time, the kids are going crazy and you don't know what to do anymore. At noon time, hallelujah, you've lost your job and you don't know what to do anymore. Listen to what she did. She took the boy and put the boy in the bedchamber of your life. 
Elisha, she shut the door behind her and she began to walk. She saddled her donkey and the husband said unto her, where are you going, my, my lady? And she said, I'm going to the man of God. And uh, he said, is it, it's not, no, it's not moon time. It's not summer season. It is not this or that. Is everything well? Listen to what she said. All is well when she has a dead boy in her house and she said all is well when you've lost your job and you say all is well when the husband is gone and left you uh, with 12 kids all by yourself all is well when they're broken up the church and you you don't see a way out all tell somebody all is well hallelujah when your spouse is stuck in africa and there is no way out oh hallelujah can i preach about this word amen she said all is well everybody asked her she knows she got a situation that she can tell nobody about in her home the boy is dead and the boy has not gone on a vacation but is literally dead but she says all God Almighty, which one of you can have that kind of faith and you say all is well when literally everything is the opposite direction. Everything is all messed up. Everything is all disorganized. But it is well. It is well. Slap somebody, tell them it is well. I said slap somebody and tell them it is well. Oh yeah, it is well. It is well, woman of God. It is well, servants of God. It is well. It doesn't look like it is well, but it is well. In the eyes of man, it is not well. But you need to see seeing with the eyes of man and see in the eyes of God. Because in the eyes of God, it is well. Faith is used in the eyes of God to look at situations. And because of faith, she said it is well. And she come to Elisha and the Lord hid the situation from Elisha. I mean, I thought Elisha was a prophet who could see anywhere. But the, he said, the Lord has hid it from me. But I perceive this woman is in sorrow. She's in, in, in grievous sorrow. And uh, Gehazi tries to cast the woman away from Elisha. And Elisha said, let her alone. She is in sorrow. And the Lord has hid it from me. Even with your anointing, not everything God will show it unto you. That sometimes God will require you to go to a service without feeling any goosebumps. No fire in your hands, but I ex expect you to walk in a healing mantle. Because sometimes men of God, Pastor Paul, all we're waiting for is the moving of the Holy Spirit. And we're waiting for signs and, you know, and sometimes I feel fire in my hands. But there's sometimes you will worship and pray and there's no fire in your hands. And you're like, okay, God. But you got a situation looking at you. God has hid it from you. Because we've been so dependent on walking by sight. The Bible says that just shall leave. Romans 1.17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just don't live by their credit. Your credit may not get you a Range Rover Vela. But, but your faith will get it for you. Your credit is messed up. You ain't got nothing in your bank account. You ain't got no deposit, but you got faith. Faith is a currency that operates before the eyes of God. With faith, I can purchase anything I need. Where is your faith? Where is your faith? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Faith is the opposite of fear. And fear and faith can sit on the same table and walk hand in hand. Because they do not agree. So you can be fearful and walk in faith at the same time. Can two walk together unless they be agreed? You can be full of fear and you think the dead shall rise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Come with me. Mark 8, no, Matthew 8, 26. Matthew 8, 26, everybody. They've been, they've been, you know, on the waters and rowing on the waters going somewhere. And, uh, and suddenly there is a tempest and the tempest is blowing contrary to the boat wherein they were. And they woke Jesus up because the Lord was sleeping. Listen to what he said unto them. Why are ye fearful, O ye of little? Why are you fearful? That means the Lord was expecting them to use their faith. 
because he's been with them for three years already. He expects them to use their faith and cause the storm to come down. But they're so fearful. They're rowing in their own power, trying to build a ministry in your own power and skill. Hallelujah. Yet you got anointing in you. You got faith in you. You got everything in you. Simply rise up and rebuke the wind and the wind shall obey. What manner of man is this that even the winds and the storms obey him? This man is a man of faith. That's the kind of man he is. Somebody shout amen. Somebody shout amen. Listen everybody. Gehazi thrust a woman away and Elisha said, let her alone. She is grievously sorrowful. She has something going on that I don't even know because the Lord has hid it away from me. And Elisha took his staff or his rod, gave it to Gehazi and said, go let the rod on the young boy and he shall come back to life. Gehazi goes. But he has one instruction from Elisha. Salute no man. Somebody says, salute no man. Hallelujah. Salute no man. And this is our problem. We go and we think we are going to walk in faith. But we are saluting everybody along the course of the way. Saluting or greet no man doesn't mean don't you greet anybody physically. It means you're a soldier engaged in warfare. Why are you entangling yourself in the affairs of this life? Oh God, for no man that worrieth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life. That's what your Bible says in 2 Timothy 2 verse number number 2 and verse number 4. Hallelujah. Can we go there quickly? For no man that worrieth, hallelujah, oh God of mercy, shanda robo. Find that scripture, if you will, that entangleth himself in the affairs of this life. Why are you engaging yourself in the secular things of the world when you're going to worship? Salute no man you have to minister why are you watching Netflix before you come to the altar salute oh God can I preach this word 2 Timothy 2 4 for no man that uh, that worth entangleth himself hallelujah Netflix is of this world in heaven there is no Netflix in heaven there is no HBO in heaven there is no show, show time or Cinemax hallelujah or YouTube to watch every kind of nonsense you watch on YouTube in, oh Lord Somebody shout hallelujah. You're a soldier of the cross. Soldiers are not civilians. Hallelujah. Look at verse number three. Everybody back up to 2 Timothy. Verse number three. They were for endure hardness as a good soldier. The Bible calls you a soldier. The last time I checked, a soldier is not a civilian. But here you are engaging yourself in civilian affairs. Yet you're going to fight a spiritual war. Hallelujah. Salute no man. The reason you lay hands on the sick and they don't recover because you saluted somebody on the way. You were engaged in the affairs of this life on the way. The reason you pray. Hallelujah. And there is no miracle because, oh Lord, I wish I could preach it the way I feel it. Oh, Shando Rabakasaya. Can I preach this word? I said, Can I preach this word? Listen to what Jesus said. Uh, because I'm out of time. Let me go through this quickly. They came to, uh, to the house of Jairus. Uh, and the Bible says, uh, Then the boy, the girl died. The girl died. And they said unto Jairus, Why troublest thou the master anymore? For the young child is dead. Jesus said, Only. God only believe when the situation has died. Only believe. And the Bible says, Jesus. Now I want us to go there with, with me quickly, everybody. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, verse number 36. Everybody, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only. Be not of in other words, don't you fear? Don't fear, have faith. Because faith and fear cannot work together. Be not afraid, brother James. Only be not afraid, brother Jacob. Only sister Violet, be not afraid. Only hallelujah. Tell somebody, only believe. Listen to what happens in verse number 
37. And he suffered. That means he allowed no man to follow him except Peter and James and the brother of John. And, and, uh, John and James, the brother of John. Why does Jesus not even allow the other nine disciples to go with him? He had 12 disciples chosen by name, but he only allows Peter, James, and John to go with him. All the others are left out. Yet the Bible says they were going all together, Pastor Paul. But a time comes and uh, Jesus says, now you, Bartholomew, I don't need you. Judas, I don't need you. Simon, I don't need you. You, I don't need you. Only bring Simon, Peter, James, and John. Why? Because these are the only people who had seen Jesus in his glory on the mountain of transfiguration. When you see the glory of God, you don't have room for, for unbelief and for lack of faith. The reason, oh God, the reason we don't believe is because we've not seen the glory of the living God but they encountered the manifested glory of God and the Shekinah glory came down and the father spoke and said this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased and uh, Peter said Lord we should build three tabernacles one for you one for Elijah the other for Moses hallelujah but the father was prevalent they saw Jesus being transfigured all the others saw Jesus in his normal form but these ones saw Jesus being transfigured. Some of you see Pastor Bella the way she is. And you call her at 2 p.m. And you talk to her as Rita Bella. And you call Dr. David and you speak with him as David Kunobwa. But the Bible says if you receive a man of God in the name of a man of God. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. I'm going to be out of your way momentarily. But listen to this everybody. Jesus sends all the other apostles away and he goes with Peter, James and John. There are people also who are in the church with us but there are some places and zones and dimensions in prayer I never go to with everybody. With, uh, there are some levels I never hit with everybody. And they come to the house of Jairus. Listen, the Lord cast them all out and the Bible says Jesus said, shut them all out. Somebody says shut them all out. Shut out the unbelievers, the unbelieving Christians, the unbelieving believers, those who don't believe, shut them all out. Because the level you're going to, their faith cannot sustain you on that level. There are people who can believe you can get a good car, but they don't believe you can get a 2021 vehicle or a 2020 vehicle. Their faith is not on your level. Pastor Paul is a man of faith. He's a man who buys a house with no credit, with no down payment, with nothing. The just shall live by faith. Hallelujah. Pastor Bella has some faith. Hallelujah. <laughs> but her faith is not on my level. When I get crazy, I get crazy and she knows that. Even her, she can't stop me. Because the another anointing has sat on my head. That's why sometimes I do things without letting her know. Because if I tell her, she will stop me. After producing results, then I show her the results. Because you're going to shut them out. Whether it's your wife or your husband, shut them out. Oh, you didn't get what I said. <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. When we were about to buy a home, she told me, Why are you crazy? Why are you looking for a home without a down payment? Your credit is messed up. It's, oh God. Hallelujah. And I had to shut her out. When I was about to get a new vehicle recently, I had to shut her out. I only told her, I've already got it. She's like, huh? <laughs> shut them out. Tell somebody, shut them out. Or you shut out the unbelievers. They profess to be Christians who believe with you. The nine apostles. But there are some levels God will never take you to with everybody around you. I know you love them, but shut them out. Tell somebody, shut them out. Tell somebody, shut them out. Listen to verse number 39, everybody. Verse number 39, raise up to your feet, everybody. Verse number 39. Mark 5, 39, everybody, I can hear you. And when he was coming, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado? And with the damsel is not. Ah, Jacob, the young girl is not dead. She's only sleeping. That means if she's sleeping, I'm here to wake her up. You can wake up situations that are dead. That's why God doesn't say she's dead. 
she's only sleeping. Because according to his faith, she's not dead. But according to your faith, she's dead. That's why you can't resurrect the situations. And he can. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Even when he was going to the tomb of Lazarus, Lazarus is already dead for days. And he says unto the disciples, I have to go to Bethany that I may wake our friend Lazarus up for he is sleeping. And the disciples said, Lord, if he is sleeping, he shall wake up. And then the Lord spoke plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad that for your sakes I was not there that you may believe. Lazarus is only sleeping. But when they heard he's dead, ay, 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 ay. Hallelujah. There was a time, another pastor friend of mine who was going to go pray for a child who had died. And uh, we made an appointment for a whole week. We know about it and uh, we are going. Just the day we were about to go, he calls me. He's like, you know what? I have a stomachache and I got a headache and, uh, and I can't go. <laughs> for, for real, he told me I got a stomach and a headache. And I can't go. Suddenly, the whole week is fine. Suddenly, he has a headache. On the real day, you can imagine. Those are people you need to... <laughs> she said somebody had diarrhea. <laughs> Those are the people you need to shut out. Those are the people you need to... Listen, everybody. Verse number 40. What happened? Verse number 40. And they laughed him to scorn. God, there are people who shall laugh at you in your mess. Is it really possible for that to happen? And they'll laugh you to scorn. But listen, everybody, the Bible says, but when he had put them all out, everybody put them all out. And now he is with the people. Only Peter, James, and John who have seen the glory. Hallelujah. Because you may be trying to lay hands on the girl, wake up, Talitha Kuma, and they're like, Lord, she's already dead. <laughs> God, she's... Shut them out! Shut them out! Hallelujah. Shut them out! If you look in the Bible, every man of God that had an armor bearer, those armor bearers were almost as strong and as anointed as the men of God themselves. Elisha was the armor bearer of Elisha. Of Elijah. Gehazi is the armor bearer of Elisha. That's why when he took money, Elisha cursed him with leprosy. Hallelujah. The disciples followed Jesus and they took on the mantle. Joshua was the armor bearer of Moses and the mantle was transferred to him. Rebecca, little Kutesa, where are you? <laughs> huh? As you walk with Pastor Bella, she's a woman of faith. That's why I haven't found somebody yet to walk with me. Because my faith is crazy. My faith, I can walk in a building and I can lay hands on a building and expect the building to happen. Hallelujah. Shando, Shadabahaya, Zekatarakotaya, Shandaradozo Velekataya. Somebody says, shut them out. There are people you got to shut out of your life. When you're doing a 40 day fast, Jacob, shut them out. Every girl who texts you at 2 a.m., shut them out. They're not on your level. You're trying to reach the glory. And hi, Jacob, sweetheart. Oh, they'll drag you to the ground. There are some people who talk in your ears and you feel the anointing leave you. Because they've, <laughs> they've just... <laughs> they didn't do what They simply spoke to you. And you feel, God. <laughs> shut them out. If you try to call me and my phone is off, no, I'll shut you out. Hallelujah. Don't you whine, don't you cry, I'll simply shut you out. Because I'm going to another level. Hallelujah. Even when Elijah was about to go to embark on a 40 day journey, he had a servant, his own armor bearer. But in 2 Kings, 1 Kings chapter number 18, the Bible says he, lay, he came to Damascus and then he left his servant there. And Elijah, Elijah went on. There's some people you cannot go to the next level with. You can't go to the next level with Facebook and checking everybody's WhatsApp status. Some things are full of demons. Shut them out. Social inspirations. 
by drawing the anointing out of you. Shut them out. Tell somebody, shut them out. Who am I talking to? The things you got to shut out of your life. Because the level you're going to, God cannot tolerate every junk, every nonsense the world has equipped you with. You're a soldier entangled not in the affairs of this life. That you may only, that you may please him who enlisted you as a soldier. Shut them out. Shut them out. Shut them out. Shut them out. Hallelujah.